I would like to call the Seneca Valley School Board um, voting session of March 14, 2022 to order. Um, at this time, I would ask that everyone join me in a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. Uh, typically, we would have someone, uh, one of our students doing, I led the pledge, however, uh, we're unable to have that today. So you guys are stuck with me. But if I could ask everyone to rise and the flag would be over here to our right. right. Yep, on the other side of that. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, you're not the only cute. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Mizzle, if you call the roll, please. Ms. Bradle. Here. Mr. DeTulio. Here. Ms. Harrison. Here. Mr. Hester. Here. Mr. Jacobs. Here. Mr. Nickel. Present. Mr. Peterson. Ms. Whittle. Mr. Widowson. Here. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our. Uh, uh, information reports, and we'll start with student staff recognition. Ms. Andresi, please. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. President. We actually have two items this evening for recognition. Our first item under information reports is senior Seneca Valley senior Daniel Spear has been named a finalist in the 67th annual National Merit Scholarship Program held by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. Mr. Spear is one of approximately 15,000 finalists and will now advance to the next level of the program where he will have the opportunity to earn a National Merit Scholarship and ultimately the Merit Scholar title. So we congratulate Daniel on an awesome job representing Seneca Valley. Moving on to item B is our All-Star Club Award winner for March. And briefly as a reminder and for your background, the Seneca Valley All-Star Club was developed to officially recognize and show appreciation to Seneca Valley classified employees, which include secretaries, paraprofessionals, custodial and maintenance employees, cafeteria personnel, and bus drivers who are often the unsung heroes of our schools. And it is my honor to announce that the Seneca Valley All-Star Club Award winner for March 2022 is Danielle McGill, a member of our maintenance crew right here in the Seneca Valley Senior High School. So please welcome to the podium, Ms. McGill. At this time, I would also like to welcome Mr. Randy Miller, our Seneca Valley Buildings and Grounds Director, to come to the podium. Mr. Miller nominated Ms. McGill for tonight's award. He would like to share with you his nomination. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Andresi. Uh, good evening, board members and administration. I'm very proud and honored to have nominated Ms. Danielle McGill for the SV All-Star Club Award for March. Danielle is a third generation McGill and began as a sub-custodian with the district when she was only 16 years old. Danielle's grandfather retired from the district after 26 years as a maintenance man at CVE. Danielle's father, Dan McGill, who is also here with us this evening, is currently the maintenance man at the Intermediate High School and in his 36th year with the district. It's truly a family affair for the McGills as Danielle, Danielle's brother, Zach, also with us today, is a district driver, and her husband, Remy, is a maintenance man at Hain, also with us here this evening. Now a little background on Danielle. She attended Butler Botech with a focus on heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. During her senior year, she advanced to states and placed 13th in the nation for sheet metal fabrication. During her early career, she was a sheet metal fabricator for 15 years and also the shop manager. Danielle always had a desire to work in the, in the district. And in 2008, she returned as a sub custodian. In 2019, Danielle was hired as a full-time custodian and very quickly advanced and was promoted to a level three maintenance woman right here in the senior high school in January of 2021. Thank you, Danielle, for all your hard work and dedication, and congratulations on this very much deserved award. 
And at this. And at this time, I'd like to present you with your all star award. Danielle, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, when I was 15, I was told if I wanted to drive, I needed to be able to pay for it. So that started my career at Seneca Valley at Evans City with Mary Beamer as summer help. Since then, I have went to Votech, as Mr. Miller said, and I've um, strived very hard to be in this district. Who would have thought my first job and hopefully my last job will be here at Seneca Valley? I wanted to thank my dad and my stepmom for instilling a hard work ethic and um, for my kids and my husband for supporting me and dealing with all the different shifts for me to get to the job that I absolutely love. Thank you again for this award. Ms. McGill, can I, can I ask you to come back up to the podium? I'm, I'm gonna ask board members if they have any questions or comments for you, if you don't mind. No, that's uh, we'll fine. put you on the, the hot seat. So I'll look around the table, um, Mr. Nickel. Well, first, I want to say I was a little confused when uh, Mr. Miller said you were a third generation uh, McGill. I thought, wait, is there only three generations in your family? <clears throat> but I see now it's third generation uh, in the district. So yes. I just uh, I, I love the fact that it is sort of it's a family affair. That's great. Thank you, yeah. you know, dad and, and, and grandfather and the time that he spent uh, here. Second, uh, uh, Mr. Petulli and myself and now Mr. Uh, Jacobs and Mr. Peterson serve as liaison over to the Butler area of Otec. So. I love that connection. <clears throat> I've certainly seen lots of young men and women come through who have gone to like regionals and states and on to nationals. So that's just, I know that's not why we're top here tonight, but I just think it's very cool. And I just wanted to commend you for that. And third, just thank you, um, you know, uh, for, the, for the role that you play, for your love of the district um, and for the work that you do here at Seneca Valley. So thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nickel. Any others? Dr. Vital. <laughs> The uh, many people in our district know how I feel about um, hiring women in non-traditional um, jobs, right? And sometimes when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, people automatically go to race. And while race is a part of that, there are many other areas when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is one of those. Because when Mr. Miller was interviewing for maintenance, I said, do you think we can find a woman because we don't have very many women in our maintenance custodian staff overall? He was like, that's going to be impossible. I said, well, let, let's try. Let's try, right? And he, I remember the day he interviewed you. He came rolling over to my office. He said, wow, we not only found a woman, we found one of the most qualified maintenance people I have ever met. He said, she might be more qualified than some of our current staff. I don't know if he meant your dad, your brother. I don't, I don't. I'm just saying that um, you are a hard worker. You are very skilled. And I am so proud that you work at Seneca Valley and that you chose Seneca Valley and so many of your family members. You're all very hard workers. This, um, you know, I, I often hesitate to hire family members, right? Because that can be problematic. This is a family that they are all very hard workers. So kids, you have big shoes to fill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think on that note, uh, we're gonna let you go because that was the perfect ending. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we got to do pictures. I'm, I'm still in virtual mode. Sorry. Oh, okay. We're going to come down and try to do that. This is the cover for your award. Okay. When we're done. Do this first, or yeah, if you want to do that, go ahead. All right, and, and so yeah, which one do you want? The umbrella? So, of okay. course, SD swag is always something. Mm -hmm. so I'll let Dr. Buckhelm present the good stuff. I'll just put everyone needs an umbrella, right? And lots of other good SV gear. 
So, Don't let the kids steal it. That's right. They'll try. <laughs> that, that is yours. That is all yours. And we're going to take a photo as well. I'll put this one for this in the back. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to our next item, item C under dates to remember. March 15th marks the end of the seven through 12 SBAOC cyber third nine weeks. March 18th, which is this Friday, marks the end of the third nine weeks for in-person grades seven through 12. This is also an Act 80 day, so there is no school for students. March 20th, that is the first day of spring. March 26th, this is an important date to note. This is the makeup date for the March 12th SAT exam, which was postponed because we had weather this past weekend. March 28th is the release of report cards for grades seven through 12. March 31st will be the Seneca Valley Foundation's Pleased to Thank You event, which will be held at 6 p.m. at Steamfitters Event Center here in Jackson Township. April 2nd is the beginning of Ramadan. This is also an ACT testing day at the Senior High School at 7.30 a.m. Also want to note that it's Paraprofessional Appreciation Day. And then April 5th, Josh Ship will be giving a presentation in the Intermediate High School Auditorium. That begins at 6.30 p.m. And I believe there is a flyer in your backup. Any questions, Mr. President? Are there any questions for Ms. Andresi? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on to uh, the next item, which is the Eccles Feasibility Study Update. And that's gonna be Dr. McCarty, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to introduce Jeremy Beatty from Eccles Architecture and Engineering. And as he enters the, moves up to the podium, just to, as you remember, last month we had Davis Demographics provide a short overview update, update excuse me, as we progress through this process. This evening, Mr. Beatty will provide you an update on the feasibility side of the study. Mr. Beatty. Thank you, Dr. McCarty. Uh, if I'm not loud enough, please tell me to speak up, but I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, we did want to give a quick update. I'm not going to use too much of your time tonight, but um, there's essentially three quick things that we want to go through tonight. Briefly, just a general overview of the feasibility study process, uh, things that we've done up to this point, and then the next steps. So everybody should have a packet. Uh, if you don't have a copy, I think Dr. McCartney does have some extras. Uh, so page two, um, on the left side, I broke down kind of the phases for each part of the feasibility study. Uh, the first step is defining what the goals or objectives are of the study. Um, next would be the data co or collection of the data. Uh, next would be the analysis. And then finally is development of options. So when we look at the right side of the page here, the goals and objectives, um, obviously one of those is to look at each one of your facilities, identify some of the needs or um, inefficiencies or um, deficiencies that each one of the buildings have. Uh, we look at the site and also the building systems. Um, the next part of that is looking at the learning environments and the educational program. Um, now this has been kind of a vital part that Dr. McCartney and uh, Dr. McKinley have been involved with is trying to really see how the buildings um, are utilized currently 
academically, and then start to look at how you want to use the facilities in the future. So when we get to the development of options, then we can really look at holistically uh, how the buildings are able to uh, continue the, the things that you want to pursue in the future academically. Um, next is the projected enrollment. Uh, you guys had the demographic uh, update from Davis last month. Um, so as they continue to gather that uh, information um, and we provide them with um, the capacities for each one of the buildings, then we can start to narrow in on um, specifically how the buildings will get um, maybe distribution of students uh, in the future because you obviously are closing down the Evan City school, school and then opening up the new Ermin Crest School. So that'll all kind of tie together. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the capac capability of the buildings to accommodate your growth. Uh, you guys in Western Pennsylvania are not similar to a lot of other schools and all the growth that you guys have been experiencing. So we want to kind of tie all that up into the feasibility study and evaluate all these uh, aspects of it. And then, as I had mentioned, we want to develop options uh, for you to consider as far as addressing physical uh, elements, the buildings, the educational aspects that I mentioned, and then also addressing the capacities. So as we turn to the, the next page, this gives a brief rundown of the uh, tasks that we've completed up to this point. Myself and several of our other architects and engineers have walked all the facilities, um, observed all the existing conditions and have had conversations with uh, the maintenance and uh, building staff. Um, we began to write up the study or the information identifying existing conditions, uh, some deficiencies that we've seen along the way. So we'll provide those uh, in the near future. We've had multiple meetings with the administration team here. Uh, we've looked at your recent 2015 study, coordinated projects that have been completed since then. You have done quite a few uh, smaller like maintenance items and a small, well, you've done a few larger projects with the Aquatic Center and obviously Ermin Crest. So we've kind of documented any, everything that's changed since your 2015 study. And then we've got the calculations for your building capacities for the elementary schools and also Ermin Crest. So on the following page, the discussion points, um, what we, these are some items that we had in conversation with Mr. Miller, Dr. McCarty, and uh, Dr. McKinley. Um, so we want to look at the potential renovations for the existing buildings as we move into the uh, next steps. Um, and one thing that we've noticed is there's a lot of students, as you guys are well aware of, from the intermediate school to the high school. So as we develop options, we wanna look at how maybe there's potential connections between the two buildings, um, what maybe programmatic things that we can improve between the two buildings. Um, so those will be coming in options that we're uh, beginning to look at. Your enrollment since the 2015 study has gone up by approximately 312 students. Now the most, most of those new students are in your elementary schools. So if that trend continues, which we'll get um, more information from Davis, um, as we develop options, we're gonna have to see how your buildings are at capacity or close to capacity now, and maybe how the, um, there could be potential additions at certain schools. So we'll look at all of that through um, meetings with Davis and then also through our options. Um, another item that is kind of different from your 2015 study is you're starting to look at the extended day kindergarten, and then hopefully in the future you get to full day kindergarten. So we have to see how that impacts your capacities um, since you're, you couldn't do like two half day kindergartens anymore. So we have to see how that um, impacts your capacities and buildings. And then another one was uh, really trying to create more collaborative and flexible spaces. Um, obviously the new construction at Ermin Crest, you guys, with that being a kind of clean slate, you're able to develop spaces that 
really work with the future education at Seneca Valley. So we certainly want to look at maybe ways we can improve that like across all of your buildings. All right. So next steps, um, as I had mentioned, between ourselves, the administration and um, Davis demographics, we really want to start to look at um, how the enrollment of uh, your district is increasing, how we can um, best utilize the buildings that you have and then begin to look at the options. Um, so we'll have continued administration meetings. Um, we'll develop potential redistricting strategy, strategies with the demographer, the administration and transportation is gonna play a vital role in that because we'll really wanna see uh, how your student populations maybe differ from the size of your buildings. Obviously, Hain is one of your larger elementary schools. So we'll have to see how locations of buildings, student populations kind of divvy up between the schools if there is potential for shifting students around. Uh, we'll continue to have school board updates. Uh, we'll provide a draft report here likely in the next coming weeks. And then obviously the final report. But our intention is between now and the final report, we'll have multiple conversations with you as uh, the school board and also with the administration um, to keep you guys moving forward because Urban Crest is going to be hopefully opening here uh, come fall. So in the meantime, we'll have to have at least the information to you so you can begin to see if you do need to not just move students from Evan City directly to Urban Crest. Maybe there has to be another way of dividing up students. So hopefully this study kind of helps you guys along with that. Mr. President, before we move to questions, I thought I could provide a little bit more information to giving you a little bit bigger picture. So next week, I was in contact with Davis Demographics, and they will be finalizing our study areas and be able to provide the draft summaries. So these are those very important documents we've been waiting for. And Mr. Beatty's team will be working with us and Davis to include this information in the overall feasibility study report. And based on the results of the findings, this will help us to determine to what extent, if any, the district would need to consider redistricting. If the data shows the need for potential redistricting, next month the board will be presented with information and potential options to best align the district enrollment zones. Uh, fortunately, years ago, this board, when planning for Urban Crest, did build it larger than the current Evan City structure. So we have some ability to you know, absorb students into the larger building. So that's definitely a benefit. Um, a few factors that are impacting these decisions, obviously, it's a, it's a location change from Evans City to the new Ermine Crest, as well as increased enrollment and providing the extended day kindergarten program that we just discussed. And a little bit related to full day kindergarten, as you know, Ermine Crest is designed for full day. The other three buildings that we have, Rowan, Hain, Conoquinessing Valley, obviously were not designed for that in their original construction. So hence the reason for both the feasibility and a demographer study to look at how can we and when can we pull the trigger on the full day program. However, I do wanna share um, what Mr. Beatty said about the extended day program. And we've had some discussion in the past, but I thought I'd give you a, a little bit more detail related to what we're looking to do next fall. And as you know, we've had a number of increased supports and programs due to the impact of the pandemic on our students and community. In a similar approach, we are using a portion of our federal funds to create an extended day program for incoming kindergarten children identified as needing additional support. So specifically, who I'm talking about are children facing economic challenges, those who would qualify for our federal free and reduced lunch program, our English language learners, children with special education needs, as well as our children in foster care and experiencing homelessness. So what we're going to do is provide these children an extended day program. We're gonna provide them breakfast. We're gonna provide them lunch. We're also obviously gonna be providing them transportation. And the idea is to equalize that playing field. Uh, as our community has been challenged through the pandemic, like all communities, we feel similar to our summer school program we ran last summer, we'll continue to run this summer our after school tutoring programs. This program is specifically identified to engage children coming into our district, to equalize that playing field, as I said, to give these kids an opportunity to be successful by the time they enter the first grade. So with 
all of that information, I think we can open up questions to either Mr. Beatty or myself. Questions from the board, Mr. Nickel. Uh, Dr. McCarty, if I could just follow up <clears throat> um, on your point, and the answer to this may be that we just don't know yet, but do we have any sense of numbers in, in terms of students for this program in the fall? Yes, what we did is in the planning of this, we actually ran numbers that would be existing this year. So we looked at all those groups that I identified and that was um, in part to give the principals an idea of, okay, what kind of numbers are we looking at? What kind of spacing what we'd need? What kind of staffing concerns will we have? But we're, you know, ballparking about 150 students that would be able to get support through this program. Well, that, uh, the follow-up to the follow-up was a spacing in terms of where, I mean, are these going to be spread throughout our four different elementaries? Yes. Our plan is to have all four of the K through four buildings would provide this program to the students who are currently in that enrollment area. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. And just a quick question for, maybe it's for Mr. Beatty, maybe it's somebody in the administration, just timeline. I think you suggested that but the final report might be available in weeks. So is this something, and, and again, this might be Dr. Patel, uh, it may not be, but when will we be sitting down as a board and contemplating some of the, the findings in a final report? Do we anticipate that in the next month or two? Or I could probably field that as well, and then Mr. Yeah. Beatty can fill in the, the extra piece. Uh, as I mentioned, the Davis piece, the demographer piece, as they've been working in line with Eccles, what they are going to be able to provide us next week is the preliminary information that gives us the idea of what we're looking for two, three, five, seven, ten 10 years, which was necessary as Mr. Beatty's team is putting together our building capacities. So our goal would be as a collective group within about the next two weeks is taking a look at what the demographer put together, lay that beside what the, demo or I'm sorry, the feasibility study is putting together. So with the hopes of next month during our board meeting that we would be able to provide options on the demographer side as far as if it's necessary to redistrict or not, but then I'll turn it over to Mr. Beatty for that final report would come later. Yeah, the, the final report, we're probably actually gonna include some of the information that comes out of the following board meeting. Uh, we also want to look, so for your next board meeting, you're really gonna have an outline of maybe steps coming for the following year um, and how demographics impact that. But beyond that, we wanna look at the options that are maybe uh, what your demographics are showing for five, 10 years down the road so we can have options built into uh, maybe increasing school sizes if necessary to kind of absorb some of that increased growth in uh, po student population. So that's kind of the, <laughs> I guess, final step, which would be probably in the May timeline. If I continue to, I mean, and where I was sort of going with all this is, is in Dr. McCarty, you say, if we need to redistrict, if we assume, or at least if the option or the path we take is yes, we're gonna to have to do some redistricting, which I gather is more likely than not, uh, I could be wrong. Um, is this something that we as a board will give some, you know, approvals for before we take our July break or, well, okay. So that, so that parents out in the district have a, a clear sense of where their child is, what building they're going to before. Uh, okay. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank uh, you. And depending on how many children are impacted to weighs in on that decision. If for instance, you know, 20 children would be impacted, then it'd be very minimal. However, 150, 200 children, obviously there's a different layer of engagement with the community that we'd need to address with that as well too. I would add also that we're working towards minimal impact, that that is always a goal of ours. So, you know, we have the new building. Um, it is likely that a majority of the current Evan City children would go to that building, very likely, but we can never make any promises. That's why we're doing all of the data research and making sure that where we place children, they would be there for a few years instead of moving children again. It should be less than 200 students, but we won't know until April and May. And most definitely parents would should know by June. Again, um, we're one of the few districts in the state of Pennsylvania that is still growing. And that's important to note, the growth is manageable. We want to make sure that also when we open the new building, if we can take any pressure off our other elementaries, all of our elementaries are at capacity. So we want to make sure if we can take any pressure off those buildings and place children into the new building, um, we would do that. But again, um, we don't have extra space 
in any elementary building, not even the new building. And that's why we cannot offer full day kindergarten in the fall as we had hoped. But we did see this coming and we've been preparing the board. But that is our goal. We'd like to, in the next two to three years, open full day kindergarten. But if we keep growing at the rate we're growing, um, we would need uh, much more space to do that. So um, stay tuned. Um, as I said, we will, we will keep any redistricting that would occur minimal and we would work with parents and identify those families as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vitale. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Jacobs. Just quickly, Dr. McCarty, as it relates to the extended kindergarten, could you just talk a little bit about the staffing considerations for that? Is that absorbed by current staff and paras or how do we, how do we think about that? No, we would need additional staff. Um, I'm looking at four to five teachers that would be specific for that extended day kindergarten. We also need to look at some of the special areas as well. As you know, we have special area teachers that travel between Rowan and Evans City. We would need to take a look at that because we will be providing opportunities for this program to engage in not necessarily the same traditional style specials, but a version of that. Uh, without getting into grand detail, what's exciting about this program too is it's going to allow us to really look holistically at the children and beyond just, you know, for years, public education has looked at, okay, when children struggle in math, you give them more math. Well, we found over the years, that's not always the best approach. So we're looking at unique ideas like creative play and instructional play and how do we engage kids that is in a very instructional based environment however, provide supports holistically. As I mentioned, you know, the food is one of the big pieces, providing children breakfast and lunch. But I went a little further on your staffing question, but yes, it's, we're looking to be about five teachers for the kindergarten level and then some supports through the special areas. Any other questions, comments? I would oh, add on the staffing that uh, we will supplement with federal funds. So that won't be completely um, embedded into the budget. I mean, it will be in the budget, but it won't uh, completely be from local funding or state funding. We're looking at federal funds for that. And I, I would have the board and the community keep in mind that the children we will be targeting were three-year-olds when the pandemic started. And they had a lot of disruption to their services of preschooling programs, daycare centers were closed. It's another reason that we need to step back and make sure that we're identifying um, the right children, the earliest learners, where so many fundamentals are built, you know, and, and um, we know that children need to read by third grade and first grade is, is a pivotal year for reading, but that starts at age three, four, five, you know, you don't just magically read by first or second grade. So that's another reason we're targeting our earliest learners. Thank you. Any others? I'd just like to make the, the point that, you know, we did this, you know, in my tenure in 2015, you know, that was the middle of a financial crisis and it was pretty apparent what buildings needed work at that time. It, it was a no brainer. Right. Um, this is a little more in depth. Uh, and, you know, we are in, you know, has some aging buildings and things like that, but the demographics, you know, as Dr. Vitale mentioned, we're still a growing district and trying to make sure that we, we do that right. You know, and, and where are we going to put, students it makes the most sense and transportation as we all know has been such a challenge you know the last two years and it doesn't look like it's getting any better soon so i'm sure that's all going to come into this decision making process when we make it um we're going to make sure we keep everyone informed of of what we're doing how we're doing it and why we're doing it um you know i know you know Eccles has done a, a fabulous job of digging in there in the weeds getting all this data and then presenting it out. And I know it can be dry folks, but you know, it's, it's what we have to do, right? So we're gonna do the best we can to make sure that you're informed. You'll have the ability to see the information uh, and be involved as much as, as you want. So that's the, the shout out to those that are on the, the Zoom meeting with us. So um, Ms. Faye, thank you very much for the presentation. I look forward to, you know, the preliminary and then hopefully the final soon right. after. Yep, thank you all. Okay, we're gonna move on now. Uh, in your backup, you have the financial reports for operations, senior high activities, intermediate high activities, middle school activities, athletics, food services, tax collection reports, and capital project funds. Uh, this is the time now that we'll come to public comment, and there is no one signed up for public comment, so we're going to move right into the action agenda.
At this time, I look for a motion to approve the following, approval of the minutes from our work session of February 7th, 2022, and our regular meeting of February 14th, 2022, as provided in your backup. The treasurer's report is provided in our backup. The general fund bills in the amount of $3,147,875.32, that's also in your backup. And finally, the construction fund bills in the amount of $3,054,783.92, and that is in your backup. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Is there a second? Second. Uh, that one will go with Ms. Harrison. Uh, any discussion on any of these items? Hearing and seeing none, Lisa, call the roll, please. Mr. Nickel? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Bradle? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Hester? Yes. Mr. Widowson? Yes. Mr. DeTulio? Yes. Motion carries with seven in the affirmative and two absent. Thank you very much. We'll move on to administrative action. Mr. Nickel, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, under administration action, I've got uh, just two <laughs> items. They're both detailed in your backup. The first, and I'll make a motion on both of these items, is with regards to board policy to approve policy 008, our organizational chart. It is revised. It is a second and final reading. And second, for our Kennywood picnic to approve Friday, June 24th of this year as our Kennywood picnic date for 2022. That is my motion. Thank you for the motion. Is there a second? Mr. Hester, any discussion, questions, anything? Hearing, seeing none. If you call the roll, please. Mr. Nickel? Yes. Mr. Hester? Yes. Mr. Widowson? <clears throat> Yes. Mr. Jacobs. Yes. Ms. Bradle. Yes. Ms. Harrison. Yes. Mr. DeTulio. Yes. Motion carries with seven in the affirmative and two absent. Thank you very much. Move on to instruction action. Uh, Ms. Harrison, please. Thank you. Tonight, I'd like to make a motion for the following instruction action items. First would be the grant disbursements. Grant permission to apply for and disperse, if approved, <clears throat> the following grants. Number one is living donation micro grant from UPMC in the amount of $500. Funds will be utilized by Hayne Middle School Community Outreach Club to learn about kidney health. Requested by Ms. Aaron Wilcher, Hayne Middle School Principal. Second is Highmark Foundation School Grant in the amount of $7,500 for health and wellness initiatives that promote a positive school climate, specifically Funds will be used to create a chill room in Ryan Glover Middle School for students to have an inviting space to decompress from stress, learn and practice coping strategies, and utilize tools to improve mental and physical health. Requested by Ms. Annie Mersing, Director of Advancement, and Ms. Tricia Witchley, Assistant Principal. Third is Student Mental Wellness Grant funded by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, PCCD in the amount of $95,000. Funds will be used for the following, requested by Ms. Annie Durst Mercy and Dr. Jeff Roberts. First would be Youth Mental Health First Aid, Care Solace Services, Assessing Student Wellbeing, and a community campaign to address local needs for mental health and support services, as well as increase awareness that our communities are committed to taking a proactive approach toward building a positive, supportive environment. And the fourth is PA Smart STEM Educational Initiative Grant through PDE in the amount of $35,000. Funds will be used to enhance and expand educator training, advanced STEM courses. Requested by Ms. Annie Mercy and Mr. Tom Lavelle. The second item is student adjudications. Approve the following student adjudications. First is number 2021-22-04. And second is number 2021-22-07, both were provided in the backup. Third is student trip. Approve the Seneca Valley Academic Decathlon Field Trip to Southerton, Pennsylvania on March 11th, <clears throat> excuse me, and 12th, 2022 under the supervision of Mr. David Reichert. Students will miss two days of classes. Um, next is conference request. Approve the conference request is provided in the backup. Next is sign language interpreting professionals LLC client agreement. Approve the agreement with sign language interpreting professionals LLC to provide interpreting services for deaf and or hard of hearing students as provided in the backup. And the last item is the MIU for 
Governmental Agreement, approved the Midwestern Intermediate Unit 4 Intergovernmental Agreement for the 2022-23 school year. It's been discussed in the backup. Thank you for the motion, Ms. Harrison. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Whittison. Any discussion on any of these issues? Hearing and seeing none. If we can call the roll, please. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Ms. Bradle? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Nickel? Yes. Mr. Hester? Yes. Mr. Widdowson? Yes. And Mr. DeTulio? Yes. Motion carries with seven in the affirmative and two absent. Thank you. Move on to business finance action. Mr. Jacobs, please. Thank you. I will make a motion to approve the following business finance actions, all of which are included in the backup. First is budget transfers, approval of the budget transfers. Second item is the 2022-23 MIU-4 general operating budget, approve the 2022-23 Midwest Intermediate Unit 4 general operating budget in the total amount of $3,354,178, with Seneca Valley's contribution being $148,315. Next item is the next tier stadium scoreboard replacement contract. Approve the institutional special approve institutional specialties inc through the government cooperative purchasing program CoStars vendor agreement for the scoreboard replacement project to be completed in the summer of 2022 in the amount of $176,500 pending solicitor review of the final agreement. Next is the Dura Last Henry Roofing Contract, approved Dura Last Inc. through the Government Cooperative Purchasing Program, the Interlocal Purchasing System, vendor agreement for the Hain Re Roofing Project to be completed in the summer of 2022 in the amount of $177,720.78, pending solicitor review of final agreement. Next is Dura Last Inc. for Ryan Gloyer Middle School Re Roofing contract approve the Dora Last Inc. through Government Cooperative Purchasing Program, the Interlocal Purchasing System Vendor Agreement for the Ryan Glory Middle School re-roofing project to be completed in the summer of 2022 in the amount of $405,905.22, pending solicitor review. Next is Waste Management Renewal Agreement, approve the renewal agreement with Waste Management of Pennsylvania for Waste Removal Services, pending solicitor agreement. Next is Calorie Borough Tax Collector Agreement, approve the Calorie Borough Tax Collector Resolution. And the final item relates to bid awards, award bids to the following four prime contracts for the construction of the new senior high boiler plant addition pending solicitor review. The first is award general construction bid to GEM building contractors and developers in the amount of 248,743. Next is a Award the HVAC construction bid to East West Manufacturing and Supply Company in the amount of $679,700. Award the plumbing construction bid to First American Industries in the amount of $147,900. And finally, award electrical construction bid to Wright Electric Inc. in the amount of $308,877. Thank you very much for the motion, Mr. Jacobs. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Bradle. Any questions, comments? Hearing and seeing none, if you call the roll, please, Lisa. Ms. Bradle? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Mr. Hester? Yes. Mr. Nickel? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Widdowson? Yes. Mr. DeTulio? Yes. Motion carries with seven in the affirmative and two absent. Thank you very much. We'll move on to personal action. Uh, Mr. Widdowson, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight under personnel action, I'd like to make a motion to approve the appointments, contracted services, leaves, salary adjustments, stipends, retirements, and the memorandums of understanding having been discussed in executive session and provided to the board in backup material. Thank you very much for the motion. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Hester. Since we discussed these and we have a motion second, we'll go right to the roll call. Mr. Hester? Yes. Mr. Widowson? Yes. Ms. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Jacobs? Yes. Ms. Bradle? Yes. Mr. Nickel? Yes. Mr. DeTulio? Abstain. Motion carries with six in the affirmative, two absent, and one abstention. Thank you very much. Uh, we are in receipt of three pieces of communication that have been distributed to the board. Uh, so at this time, I would ask, is there any other item to be brought before our board? Uh, Ms. Bradle? I wanted to say this last week, we moved through the meeting so quickly, but I just wanted to give a shout out to our student performers, our musicians, our staff, our student crew, and our staff for Mamma Mia it was fabulous. 
every year that I go, I think it can't get any better. And I'm just amazed at the talent. So kudos to all of those people involved. It was, it was wonderful, very entertaining. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I will have a PEASERS update uh, next month because even though we had our PEASER meeting last week, we actually didn't have the meeting and it's recessed until tomorrow. First time that's ever happened. So I'll give everyone an update next month. So uh, at this time, I would look for a motion to adjourn our so meeting. Moved. Thank you, Mr. Nichols, or second. Thank you, Mr. Wittison. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed nay, we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.